All right, we are wired. Good morning. Thank you guys for being here today. We have uh, lots of visitors, so we're in the book of Acts chapter 18 this morning. Before we begin, I've asked Brother Enoch to lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to assemble and worship here this morning. Heavenly Father, we grieve for those that have lost loved ones. We uh, are concerned that the wars and, and situations around the world that endanger Christians everywhere. Heavenly Father, please be a student as he leads his class. Help us to learn better how the New Testament church spread the gospel, how the New Testament Christians treated each other, how the things that we can learn that we can apply to our lives. Heavenly Father, be with us and be with students and teach us our class. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, so today we'll be looking at Acts uh, chapter 18. The back monitor is not on, guys, just so you know. And before we uh, do that, let's recite our memory verse from Acts, the third chapter, verses 19 and 20. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. All right, that's from Acts 3. So can anybody, using our memory tool, tell me what, what happened in Acts chapter 3 to trigger that? Who's, who is speaking there, by the way? Peter. And what was the incident that happened? There was baptism. But what, was, what, was, what happened before that? To tri- there he is, exactly. The cripple was cured. Remember, C for the, uh, the cripple was cured. Exactly. So if you look at our different memory tools, there's kind of uh, difficult to see, but uh, that was from chapter 3, the cripple was cured. Here in, uh, most recently, we had uh, chapter 16P, the Philippians were converted. Chapter 17, last week, questions were answered at Athens for Q, and then R is for reasoning with the preacher, and we'll talk about that uh, later this morning. So we're over halfway through our study, and we find ourselves with Paul on his second uh, missionary journey. Uh, And on the second missionary journey, he's widening his area of of interest from the first missionary journey quite a bit. So if I were to ask you where Paul and Barnabas focused their attention on the first missionary journey, what would you say? What areas in the first missionary journey did we see him? Started from? Cyprus. Cyprus, yeah, went from Antioch to Cyprus and then? Asia, uh, actually not Asia Minor, but Galatia and Phrygia, right? He actually wasn't able to go to to Asia at that time. So we have him in the first missionary journey, Cyprus, then southern Galatia. So on Paul's second missionary journey that we find him now, what was similar to the first? We mentioned where he started from, which was? Antioch. Antioch, yeah, he started from Antioch. <clears throat> and then where does he go? Initially, he goes to revisit where? Galatia, all the churches that he had started, right? So he starts from Anna, goes to Galatia, so we're in the second missionary journey. But where Paul was not allowed to go on the second missionary journey. He wasn't allowed to go west towards Asia, and he wasn't allowed to go north towards Bithynia. So where did he go? He kind of went northwest, skirting between skirting between the two, and he went to Troas. If you'll remember there, he kind of, he's picked up a couple of traveling companions along the way. His second missionary journey, he starts off with a different traveling companion. Who does he start off with different this time? He's got Silas, thank you. So he's got Silas instead of Barnabas, and who does he pick up along the way? He picks up Luke here in Troas. Who had he already picked up in Lister or Derby? Timothy. Good job, Hunter. All right, so he's got Timothy. He's got Luke now in Troas. Uh, and then he gets the call to Macedonia. And he gets the call to Macedonia to come over and help us. So he's, he's in Macedonia. 
And he's initially persecuted uh, by the, the, the Roman citizens there of, of Macedonia, really because he's interrupted their revenue cycle, right? So he's disrupted their revenue cycle, and it's that event that results in the Philippian jailer and his household being converted, along with Lydia, who he had already come in contact with, uh, praying at the river, uh, and with her household. Uh, and, and really, that's the, that's, the nidus, that's, the, that's the church that developed there in Philippi. And it appears that Luke stays in Philippi. So it looks like, based upon his use of pronouns, that he stays in Philippi, and then he's later going to join back up with Luke, when, uh, pardon me, with Paul, when Paul comes back to Philippi on his third journey. So we've got, picks him up in Troas, he leaves him at Philippi, and then he's going to pick Luke back up on his third journey several years later. So it looks like Luke stays there in Philippi <clears throat> based upon uh, the, the wording and the pronouns that he used. So then Paul travels using that road, the Via Ignatia, uh, from Philippi to Thessalonica and Berea. And in Thessalonica, he meets really substantial resistance from who? What party? Do you remember he meets? He meets from the Jews, so he gets significant resistance uh, from the Jews. Thessalonica was an interesting city. It had a large population of Jews. At the time of the New Testament writing, probably had 200,000 plus people in it. Pretty big city uh, for, for that uh, day and age. The Jewish community actually was large in Thessalonica all the way up until the 1940s, early 1940s. They had a population of 80,000 Jews in the city of Thessalonica into World War II. What happened that caused that population to dwindle rapidly? The Holocaust, that's right. So uh, the Nazis actually invaded through the Balkans and Greece, way up here, and they uh, took those Jews and they scattered them into concentration camps and labor camps throughout uh, Europe. So up until that time, there was a very large community of Jews there in the Thessalonica region. So anyway, Paul is, is literally being pursued by these Jewish troublemakers as he moves through Macedonia preaching. And they're just on his heels and on his heels. They follow him to Berea, <clears throat> where Luke tells us that they agitated and stirred up stirred up the crowds. Uh, Paul is escorted because of that. Paul is escorted uh, by boat uh, from Berea to Athens, and he leaves Timothy and Silas behind in Berea, but he sends a message back to those uh, with the people that had escorted him and says, hey, send Silas and Timothy to me as quickly as you can, as soon as possible. So the story of Paul in Athens, we talked about, Steve did a great job last week, is really uh, a remarkable story. You remember the uh, pictures he showed of the, uh, of the Acropolis. And in the foreground of that was Mars Hill, where, where Paul actually spoke to the Areopagites. And so he's on Mars Hill, and, and literally directly in the, in the background is this Acropolis. And even today you can go there, and there's a, the largest uh, structure on top of that mountain is, is the Parthenon, which was a temple to the goddess Athena. But as you can think about this, Paul is going through the marketplace. He sees these, all these different idols. He goes to Mars Hill and literally talking to these people in the background behind him is the Parthenon. There are these huge these idols to uh, these, these different gods. And Paul tells them about a god that they don't know, but they should know the one true and living God. And you think his comments, you think in that environment, his thought comments about a true and living God, one that's not living in temples. Hint, hint, look behind me at this big Parthenon. He doesn't live in temples made by human hands. Your gods are petty, they're fickle. But he commands, he commends them for being religious and seeking out God and actually says, hey, that's the way God made us, to seek, to seek him. And he's, and he's not far from us. He's not stuck on some mountain and fickle and, uh, and, 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 um, and, and persecuting you on a whim. He actually is uh, not far from us. He wants us to seek him. We should repent of our, our, our idolatry. And the evidence based upon this is this resurrected Christ. So what kind of review does he get from the Athenians? Kind of a mixed, a mixed review, exactly. He's got some that actually mocked him. Resurrection? Are you kidding me? So he's got some that mock him. He's got some that kind of middle road, 
I'm kind of, it's interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. And he actually has some that, that believe him, others that believed. So when you think about this second missionary journey that Paul's been on, what, how would you describe that? What do you think, is this, has this been a, kind of a nice sightseeing tour? How would you describe, how would you describe Paul's trip so far? It's typical, he's been persecuted a few times. It's not been easy. He's been persecuted. He's had some success, but you think about his whole reason for going over into Macedonia in the first place was, hey, come help us. We need some help. And then he gets over there, and we talked before, it was kind of quiet in Philippi initially. And it's like, okay, what's, what are we, there's no synagogue. We had to go down to the river to find some Jews to talk to or people to talk to. They were worshipers of God. You know, it just, and then he gets this, this serious, serious uh, reaction. David? I think it would have also been a lot more physically demanding trip going over land and going by the sea. That's a really good point. So if you look here in his first missionary journey, he left from Antioch, goes to Cyprus, up to Italy, and then he makes this little, uh, on the Via Sebas here, this little uh, uh, loop and then goes back and a lot of that was by by boat here he actually is doing a lot of uh, traveling by land um, he had started off by the inland route uh, through Galatia and Cilicia here Phrygia here and so this inland route was mountainous it was he was under in fact it's told uh, we're told in other places in second Corinthians that he was robbers uh, uh, the, the different uh, uh, weather extremes right so he had he had had a, a rough trip his own camel or, you know, <laughs> well, so you think about that, the, most likely he was on foot. Now, there could have been uh, horses or donkeys or what have you, but what was the problem if you were using Roman roads and you had valuable pieces of equipment? The Romans could take it. The Romans could take it. That's exactly right. So you started off your trip with a donkey. You did not finish your trip with a donkey, all right? So most likely they did this on foot. Yes, sir. Second missionary journey, too, is a good reminder. Expect the unexpected when it comes to uh, the work of God. You have a group of women out of Riverside prison being lowered out of a window, a captive audience of philosophers, and now 18 months in Corinth, as we'll see. And there's no set formula of what's going to happen. We can't assume that we know this is going to be exactly the way it's going to work out. We'd like to have a recipe right? But we don't always get the right ingredients, right? The same ingredients. And so we want to make a cake that looks the same at the end. We want to convert people and, and bring them to Christ and uh, t- preach the gospel, but it doesn't always look the same. It's a really good point. There were multiple instances where uh, he had to change the way he talked and he had to change his message based upon the people that he was talking to. I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Travel itinerary was not even the Holy Spirit. His travel itinerary is what? He kind of, he longed to go to Rome. He wanted to go to these other areas. We'll read here in a second about his, in the first book to Thessalonians, he felt like he was ripped away from them before he wanted to. He wanted to get back to them and he was hindered in doing that uh, by Satan specifically. So yeah, there was lots of things that made this trip really, really difficult. So he's continuing to be hounded on, his ro- on this road on the Via Ignatia as he goes through Macedonia and he gets to Athens and what's he, what's he, what is he in Athens? He's alone, all alone. He's alone in Athens. <clears throat> Take a look at the, the book of 1 Thessalonians. I, I mentioned that there were some interesting things there. So if you think about, uh, if you think about this, these missionary journeys that Paul has gone on and then the letters that he subsequently writes, it's really fascinating to try and piece these together and look at some, look at some things that might have influenced him uh, as, he's, as he's writing these books. And the first letter to the Thessalonians is really a remarkable book. One of his first uh, books, somewhere written around 50, 51, some people even have it as early as 48, 49, but if you remember that we're talking right around where he's here in uh, Macedonia, Athens, and Corinth is really right around 50 AD. So somewhere in here, He's writing back to the Thessalonians that he had just visited and helped establish this church. So it's, it's, it's one of his first books. 
It was probably written while he was in Corinth during this 18-month-plus period that he was in, t- in time. But I want you to look at some of the, uh, Paul's comments in light of what we just talked about in his trip. Right? So he's made this trip. It's been difficult. He's had these mixed reviews. He's had some persecution. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6. What does he say? He's commending them. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. They became imitators of Paul and Christ. And it was tough going. It was tough going, look at that, in much affliction. So it was a rough time there in Macedonia. Look in verse 7. They became examples to others, uh, other believers in Macedonia and Greece. And their faith became known where? Verse 7. Everywhere, right? Remarkable situation here about these brothers in Thessalonica. In chapter 1 and verse 9, it tells us what they had come out of. What was Paul's and talk, uh, uh, Ben's comments about uh, changing his message and, and not having always the same uh, thing? Where did they, what, did he, what had they been taught out of? Paganism, idolatry, right? Polytheism. They had come out of this, of this paganism. <clears throat> in chapter 2 and verse 2, what's it say about his, uh, about his experience in Philippi? We know what his experience in Philippi. What happened in Philippi? He was beaten and thrown in jail, what, is, what does Paul say about that time? We suffered and we were mistreated, shamefully treated, right? Well, we know why. We just read that. Chapter 2 and verse 9 uh, tells us that, that uh, our labors, remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked day and night that we might not be a burden to you. What's he saying? They, did, they, did, they didn't live off of them. They provide for themselves. We'll talk about that today in, in chapter 18 with Aquila and Priscilla as he's working as a tent maker. So he doesn't, he doesn't uh, d- demand money from them. They support themselves. In chapter 2 and verse 14, it's really remarkable. You brothers became imitators of the churches where? In Judea. For you suffered the same things from your countrymen as they did from the Jews. Think about this. The persecution in Jerusalem and Judea that we studied about early in Acts He's equating that with what the Thessalonians experienced from their own countrymen. It was a troubling time. There was persecution. Despite that, they had persevered. They were imitators of Christ. But they suffered at the hands of these Roman citizens, just like the brothers did, the Jewish Jews did in Judea. In verse 17, I mentioned this before, he was literally torn away from them <clears throat> physically. We were torn away from you for a short time in person, but not in heart. He really wanted to see them but he was kept from that by, by Satan. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he, couldn't, he, he, was so, he wanted to see them so badly, he couldn't take the fact that he didn't know what was going on, so who does he send back? He sends Timothy back. He sends Timothy back, <clears throat> couldn't bear it any longer uh, to support them, to exhort them. He's, really, he's desperate to hear how they were doing because of that tribulation that was affecting them. He loved them and wanted to know how they were doing. And then in verse 6, <clears throat> uh, Timothy comes back to Paul uh, in Corinth, and he brings this wonderful news that really builds Paul up uh, in his faith and love. Great, provided great comfort to Paul. So you can see this great concern that Paul had for the brethren in Macedonia uh, in light of the persecution that they were suffering. And 1 Thessalonians is a great example of putting together his writings with things that had happened uh, in, 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 his, uh, in his journeys. So we come to chapter 18, <clears throat> and it tells us uh, that Paul left Athens and went to, <coughs> pardon me, he left Athens and he goes to Corinth. Let's read uh, in Acts chapter 18, we'll read the first four verses. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and the Greeks. So uh, Pontus, so where Aquila actually is from, they came from uh, Rome over here, uh, and they were now in uh, uh, Corinth, uh, where he finds them, but they had been kicked out by an edict of Claudius. This is, and uh, based upon other writings, we know this happened probably around 49 AD when they were evicted from, from Rome. <clears throat> Pontus is actually up here uh, uh, on, the, on the Black Sea, uh, where Aquila uh, was from, 
and then they uh, were in Rome, apparently had some type, probably a tent-making business before they were, they were kicked out. So if you look at, this is a, a picture of uh, Corinth. So this is the Acro Corinth, um, which is a mountain about 1,900 feet uh, above the city of Corinth. And Corinth was on, really on the crossroads. It was a very important city. It was a great crossroad uh, of the ancient world because of its location on this isthmus. So here is the ancient city. Here's the ancient ruins of the ancient city of Corinth. Here's the surrounding areas, the modern areas. This is the Acro Corinth. If you rotate this kind of counterclockwise, you're going to see this view. So you're up on top of this mountain, and you're looking down and kind of to your left, you're going to see the ancient city, ancient ruins of Corinth. But if you rotate that and kind of turn to your right, this is the isthmus. So this area right here is this. And this area is kind of over here in this area. Bottom line is you kind of rotated. Here's the isthmus. It's about four miles long. There's a port over here and the ancient city of Corinth was close to this port on the Ionian Sea. This right here, well, I'll get to that in a second, this right here is Sincrea, and this is the port to the Aegean Sea on that side. So very narrow, so it connects the, the uh, mainland of, connects this mainland of Greece through this isthmus to the, what's called the Peloponnese area and Corinth there. So that's that uh, um, uh, isthmus there that connects that the mainland Greece. It was a thriving uh, Roman colony, uh, really from the time of, of, of Julius Caesar. It's described as a very wealthy and prosperous city. Why do you think it was prosperous when you look at that picture? Trade. Two seaports trade, north, south, east, west. Uh, they were collecting taxes back and forth, up and down. They were a very wealthy wealthy city. Probably it shortened the travel. So they actually built a road. I'll show you here in just a minute, a road that they actually built. They tried to dig it. It wasn't uh, finished until <clears throat> the 1900s, but they, had, uh, they were trying to shorten that distance on that trade route. It's, Corinth is actually the capital uh, to the province of, of Achaia in that time. And <clears throat> the um, the as I mentioned, it was about four, uh, four miles uh, wide on that, that scene there. Um, every two years, they had uh, some games. So where's the most famous games in Greece? Olympia, or the word Olympic. This, every two years, they had uh, the Panhellenic Isthmian Games. I can't even say that, Isthmian Games. Every two years, it was the second largest uh, uh, sporting event uh, in Greece, and that happened here in Corinth. A large population, over 200,000 people. Um, Corinth was really the Las Vegas to Achaia. Now, why would we say that? What's another word we use for Las Vegas? Sin City. Sin City. And it truly was the Sin City. They had, the Greeks had a phrase to play the Corinthian or to Corinthianize. And what that meant was to refer to anyone who was sexually immoral or uh, living a, a significant life of, of debauchery. <clears throat> the city had attracted a variety of religious cults that had idols and temples uh, to it. In fact, on the top of the Acro Corinth, so here's on the top of this, <clears throat> was supposedly a temple uh, to Aphrodite. And at one time, that temple had a thousand prostitutes that served as priestesses in that. That was what they were devoted to, this immoral lifestyle. And that was really reflected in the church that Paul started there. Take a look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Or do you not know, he's speaking to the Corinthians here, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. This was a rotten place. And these people, these Christians, had come out of that lifestyle. He mentions that over and over in the book of the first and second book of, of, of uh, Corinthians. In fact, in, in 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> the 12th chapter is an interesting verse. Uh, in verse 21, he says, 
I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. This was a problem for the group of, of brethren here in Corinth, that they had come out of such immoral ways and were trying to live pure, and it was a constant struggle for them, and Paul knew that it was a constant struggle for them. That's where Paul spends the next 18 months plus. He's in a very wicked city. So if you think about that, <clears throat> it's interesting the response that he, that he got there. We'll talk about that in just a moment. This is the canal that our brother mentioned here before. Uh, they had tried to build a canal even as far back as in, in, in the 6th century BC. So uh, 500 plus years before Paul is talking about this, <clears throat> they had tried to dig it and it didn't work. So what they did was they built a paved road. This is remnants. You can still go over there now and see remnants of that paved road from uh, 2,600 years ago that they pulled the boats, smaller boats on. They would pull it across that four-mile isthmus to get from one side to the other. Couldn't do it with all the boats, but some, so they still uh, have remnants of that. But then, uh, ultimately, they were able to build uh, this canal that was finished uh, in the late 1800s. Um, there was a, that, that um, uh, on the southeast side of that isthmus, I showed you the port of Sincrea, uh, where Paul and his companions will ultimately uh, leave for and leave for Ephesus. So Paul comes to Corinth, and who does he find there? Aquila. Aquila and Priscilla, exactly right. And what did, he, what, did they have in, what did they have in common? What did Paul have in common with Aquila and Priscilla? Tent makers. They were tent makers. Some they were Jews. They'd been kicked out <laughs> where they had come from. All right, what else? They worship the true God. And we don't know where, at what point they had become converted, but they had a lot in common. He actually winds up living with them. Uh, but it mentions, as I, as I said before, they had been forced out of Rome by the emperor Claudius. <clears throat> and that, that edict happened in the ninth year of his reign, which would have been about, as I mentioned, 49 AD. So Paul works with them. He stays with them. Uh, <clears throat> He later refers to them in multiple places of, of his writings uh, that, that they were fellow workers. They had actually even saved his life at one point. In Romans, the 16th chapter, uh, verse 3 and 4, it actually says that they risked their lives for him. So something had happened. We don't know all the details of that. Uh, but that same passage also indicates in Romans 16 that at some point Aquila and Priscilla had gone back to Rome and they had had a, a, home, a church established in their home in Philippi, <clears throat> where they'll go to here in a little bit, but they also at some point later had gone back to Rome where they also had a church uh, established in their home. So <clears throat> we get to, we get to, Paul gets to Corinth from Athens and where does he go? Where does he always go? He goes to the synagogue. And, and what happens in, in the synagogue? It says in verse 4, the wording there. What does that tell you? What does it say? He, he tried to reason. I read that and I think, eh, didn't go so well. He tried to reason. Have you ever tried to reason with your kids? <laughs> tried. I'm glad she's not in here today. Okay, okay. Tried to reason with your kids. That's right. It didn't go that well. But he tries, he does his normal pattern, he goes to the synagogue, he's, he's preaching, he's reasoning, <clears throat> he's, uh, he's doing the same message that he always has. There's going to be a Messiah coming from the line of David. Jesus was that Messiah. You need to repent and turn to him. And that, was mixed. that, was, that resulted in mixed results. So our first question this morning is, <clears throat> how effective was Paul's work in Corinth? We said initially he goes to synagogue, and how would you describe how effective that was? Uh, yeah, let's read beginning in uh, chapter 18, verse 5, and we'll read verse 5 through 11. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed, uh, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. 
And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So his response, his, his, the reaction in the synagogue was kind of what he'd had before, mixed, a little trying. And in fact, he says he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. Which is interesting because they would have understood that language. That language is actually used in the book of Ezekiel and other places in the Old Testament. And in specifically in Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, in verse 4 and 5, he, the Ezekiel is, is telling the people, hey, if, a watch, if, a, if, if somebody's invading and a watchman blows the horn and you pay attention to it, right? that's one thing. But if the watchman blows the horn and you don't pay attention to it, your blood's where? on your own head. That's the language that he's using here to these Jews. They would have clued into that. It would have meant something to them. But he gets this reaction that he's had elsewhere. <clears throat> so he has a mixed review there. But what else does this set of scriptures here tell us in this, this section 5 through 11? Tell us about how effective his work was in Corinth. Yes, J.D. Uh, God himself said that there were many within <clears throat> the so with that context from the Lord himself, I would say that his work was actually very successful. Maybe not with the Jews in the synagogue, but among the Gentiles of Corinth, basically Aphrodite's set, basically vacation home whenever she's not on Olympus, essentially, uh, still had many people who believed in the one true God to abstain from the goddess of physical beauty and to the Greeks even of love. So, so it was successful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what we have is we have a mixed review from the Jews, but in this section it tells us who actually believed. <clears throat> the ruler of the synagogue, who was Crispus. So he had some impact effective in the Jews and to the tune of the leader of the synagogue and his whole household was converted. And then, as J.D. mentioned, many Corinthians actually believed. <clears throat> you'd, think, you'd think that he wouldn't have that. I mean, we're in, a, we're in Sin City. We're in a place that is just full of debauchery and idolatry. And he kind of, Luke's kind of juxtaposed this with his previous trip just before to Athens. What kind of impact did he have in Athens? Kind of mixed, right? Yeah. Mocked. He got mocked. He said, oh, we'll hear it again. And then some believe. Right? In, this, in a college town, right? literally a college town that, w that was dedicated to philosophy and, and, and reasoning, and he commended them for being religious. He doesn't really have that kind of major response. And he goes to Corinth, which is filled with sin. Many of them became Christians. It's amazing because the gospel message is for everyone, and the gospel message is for those who are lost, who are broken, who are sinful, just like the Corinthians were just like we are. <clears throat> it looks like early on, so, so he converts uh, Crispus and his whole household. He, he shakes off his, his, uh, his garments because the Jews are rejecting him, and where does he go? Right next door. <laughs> he literally sets up shop right next door to the synagogue in the house of, of Titius Justus, which is kind of fascinating if you think about it. So <clears throat> it looks like early on, that Paul had to support himself. How do we know that? He's working with Aquila and Priscilla. He had to support himself by working as a, as a tent maker. But then when Silas and Timothy get there, gets there, it looks like he can devote. Now, some of y'all may have different wording. My, in the ESV, it says, uh, Paul, in verse 5, Paul was occupied with the word. When Silas and Timothy arrived, Paul was occupied with the word. Does anybody else have a different? Right, so three verses before, he was having to work. What changed? Well, the church in, in Thessalonica specifically and potentially Philippi as well had supported him. And in fact, money, so Timothy comes back uh, and later on, uh, Paul will specifically say, the Thessalonians, the Macedonians supported me. So actually, let's take a look at that. Um, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's going to make it very, very clear here. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 7. 
Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? He's talking to the Corinthians here. Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. But I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia. Macedonia, those guys were on fire. And they supported Paul while he was there in Corinth. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. So one time in Philippians, uh, one, and one I believe it is, maybe two, but he talks about the Philippians were the only one that extended him for a while there. Yeah. They had, uh, and, and also one verse four, I think, is, but yes, they were a partnership with him from, from the very beginning. So um, these Macedonians and Philippi and Thessalonica, they, they were actually supporting him in his work. So uh, he supports himself uh, early on. Then uh, uh, Timothy and Silas come, most likely bringing money from the Macedonians. <clears throat> We know that he was successful uh, by converting Crispus and many of the, of the Corinthians. Um, in in uh, 1 Corinthians, the, the second chapter, though, um, it's, it's interesting because how he came to Corinth. He talks about how he came to Corinth. Um, when you normally, when Paul would normally go to the synagogue, he would normally preach what happened all the way through Macedonia as soon as he started having some success persecution would come, right? This is a little bit different. The Jews or the locals would rise up, they'd start hounding him, they'd follow him, they'd ultimately drive him out. But here he receives this vision, and the Lord comes to Paul in a vision. He says, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Go on preaching. Don't be silent. <clears throat> what does that tell us that Paul must have been feeling? Stress. Stress. Fear. Right? Yes? First yeah, uh, Corinthians 2. Verse 3. He came there, it was with fear and trembling. Also, he, he seems to have kind of, I guess, been discouraged by the response to Athens. He's uh, not trying to use uh, persuasive words or arguments. He says, I'm going to... Uh, he's, he's had a rough time. Verse, uh, let's read verse 3, what you're talking about there, Matthew. I was with you, talking to the Corinthians, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of the power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He'd had a rough time. He'd, he'd had a rough journey. He was, he was down. He was fear. He was in trembling. And God comes to him in vision and says, hey, it's not going to happen here. You're, I'm, you're not going to be persecuted. You're not going to be attacked. Keep preaching. This probably... Uh, this 18-month period probably was around the fall of, of AD 50 all the way to the spring of AD 52 based upon those other uh, uh, archaeological markings there. We kind of talked about how Quill and Priscilla <clears throat> uh, helped him. Anything anybody else want to bring on, we'll move on. So <clears throat> let's read uh, chapter 18. Let's read verses 12 through 17. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a unified attack on Paul and brought him before their tribunal, <coughs> saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So really, what we see here, is this a miracle? Is this outside the natural, physical laws? No. But who do we see working? We see God. We see God keeping his providence, uh, promise. This is the providence of God. We see how we see God's hand and providence acting in keeping him and his, uh, uh, his, uh, Paul's safety in, in relation to his keeping his promise. 
So Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia. We've talked before about what a proconsul is. He would have been the governor of this Roman province. He came from a very distinguished Spanish family. There's actually a lot of writings uh, related to Gallio, but more so his brother, whose brother was named Seneca. And Seneca was a poet, he was a philosopher, he was a, a political animal uh, that actually was a close advisor to Nero. And he actually, uh, in some of his writings, he wrote about his brother Gallio that he got sick soon after becoming, uh, soon after becoming the proconsul of Achaia. So if you think, and they served one-year terms, so he would have been a one-year term, and he, and, he, and he would have, uh, and he got sick, so this would have been very early in his, his tenure as the proconsul, if you follow that reasoning. So he had a one-year term, he leaves, we know because his brother wrote about him leaving soon after he got there because he got sick, so this would have been very early in his tenure as the proconsul, and the Jews were going to try and take advantage of that. But Luke's historical accuracy is on display again, right? He gets it to the fine details of the, of the title and the time period in which, uh, which Gallio is, uh, is in charge here. Uh, archaeology also backs up this. There was an inscription that was found in Delphi, which is between uh, Athens, pardon me, Corinth and Athens um, uh, near, uh, near Delphi. And it's a letter, it's an inscription in the form of a letter from the emperor Claudius, to his friend, his friend, Gallio, as my friend, the proconsul of Achaia. Pretty amazing. And that inscription is dated to around AD 50, 52. So again, this, his term would have been uh, around mid AD 51, so this would have happened sometime around mid AD 51. So what did, based upon this writing, what did the Jews actually charge Paul with exactly? Look at that. Verse 13. Uh, worshiping God contrary to the law. What law? Is it? Did the Jews say that? No. They're, he's talking to a Roman governor, and they say, they're, he's doing something, speaking contrary to the law. The law. He figures it out. But they kind of throw it out there, and they don't make it specific. Why? They're, the Jews are on the ropes. What had just happened a, a, a year or two before? They had been kicked out of where? Rome. They're, the Jews are not in a great place right now in terms of the Roman Empire, right? So he, is he teaching something that's illegal to Rome? Is he teaching something Ill, about the law, the Old Testament law, or Roman law? They kind of leave it nebulous they got this brand new uh, proconsul, kind of new on the job. We're going to kind of slip this in there and get him to lo uh, lower the hammer on Paul and his teaching. What would have happened had they been successful? What do we call that? That would have set a legal precedent. A governor rules against Paul because they're doing something illegal. What was the illegality? Teaching people a illegal illegal law. So if they had ruled in their favor, what would have happened to Paul as he goes traveling everywhere else? There would have been this legal precedent that he was doing something illegal. It was illegal to preach and teach. That's not what happened. <clears throat> Gallio figures it out and he says, this is a question of words and names and your own law. There's no wrongdoing. There's no vicious crime. Bottom line, you're wasting my time to hit the road. Yes, sir. I wondered if in verse 17, is Sosthenes, who is the, uh, the ruler of the synagogue, I, he may have been the one that replaced Christmas, but I, I wondered if he was a Christian too at this point, if that's why he was persecuted, <coughs> or if he was persecuted because he couldn't get the Romans to. So, interesting, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 1, there's a Sosthenes listed as, a co, as kind of a co-author of that book. We don't know. I don't know. Maybe like Stephen. I don't know. Sosthenes is a name common like Mark or, or who knows. But, but it's interesting to think about that. We also don't really know. Most likely Sosthenes was the, the next group. Crispus has already been converted to his household. He's doing all this preaching next door. And then Sosthenes gets beaten up. We also don't really know from the writing who's beating him up. 
was it, was it the Greeks that were now able to vent their hatred on the Jews? You're wasting our proconsul's time and we're going to beat you up because you're, you're taking our time. Or was it these Jews who said Sosthenes you know, didn't really represent us very well, so we're going to beat up our own uh, leader of the synagogue? It's, it's hard to tell. Bottom line is Sosthenes bore the, bore the brunt for that, and you kind of have to feel for the guy. <clears throat> but you think about this, did Paul, you know, we're kind of setting ourselves up here for another great speech from Paul, right? He's going to defend his faith. And then he goes, no. He's quiet. He's silent. This happens without anything that Paul has to do. He's not a player. He's an observer. He's a spectator in this, literally a spectator. God inserts himself into these human affairs. God provides the salvation and the protection. And Paul sits back and watches it happen, keeping seeing God keep his promise. Hugh and then Ben. It's interesting that Gallio didn't have anything to do with the beating of Sosthenes. Again, that's, that's not my problem. Not my problem. Yeah, Ben? Two things. One, a great example of faith in action. The Lord spoke to him. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what's not going to happen. And then right after that, you have this unfolding of events. How's Paul going to respond to the word that was given to him? He responded with faith. Secondly, the timing of everything in Acts chapter 18, the providence of God. Priscilla and Aquila, they have extra time with Paul. Paul's not going to set them up in the future. Later in Ephesus, yes. Paul has some time with them. All of these things, 18 months, God has given him mercy to some degree with giving him time to recover uh, with all of these things. So it's interesting seeing how God is working, whether it's a spirit forbidding him to go to certain places and then setting up these opportunities for individuals like Priscilla and Aquila to learn from him to further the kingdom. There's, so there's so much there, right? There's, we get this very short passages, but there's so much that happened in those 18 months, like building up Aquila and Priscilla, setting them up, getting them ready. They're going to have this conversation later with, with Apollos, right? They're going to go to, Phil, uh, to Ephesus with him and be in Ephesus, and he's going to leave them behind in Ephesus to help start the work there. I mean, all these things that happen uh, based upon the, the providence of God. Paul doesn't get kicked out of Corinth. He decides to leave. He, God kept his promises throughout his stay there. So he, he, stays, <clears throat> he, stays in, um, he stays in Corinth after these events, really free from persecution. And finally, he decides to head home on his journey. Let's pick this up in chapter uh, 18 and verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sincrea, he had his hair cut, uh, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he, he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. So this is a, another situation. He takes Aquila and Priscilla with him. They go to Ephesus. He leaves them behind, probably set, starting a new uh, job, starting a new shop, tent-making business. He goes to the synagogue, uh, and, he, and this is kind of this, this teaser uh, where he says, hey, I can't stay, uh, but I'll be back, right? And certainly, sure enough, we get that later on in the book of, of Acts. Um, Luke mentions that Paul had taken a vow, and he had cut his hair um, because of that vow. It's not clear what type of vow that was. There are some specific rules about Nazarite vows and what you do with that hair, and so it, it doesn't, it's, it's difficult to, to kind of mesh that with a, a, a true Nazarite vow. But regardless, Lou makes a, Luke makes a point to show us that Paul still carries out some Jewish traditions. But what does he not do? He doesn't bind it on the Gentiles. Right? He's doing that, keeping it uh, for himself, but he's, he's not imposing that on the Gentiles. And Luke compresses the end of this journey, the end of the second journey, into one really short passage. <clears throat> all, all that traveling happens in, in literally a couple of verses. He notes that he stops off in Ephesus, he leaves Priscilla and Aquila, goes to the synagogue, he briefly interacts with them, and he sets up the stage then for that third missionary journey when he comes to Ephesus, and so much happens there. Finally, Luke tells us that he lands in, what, this little passage is interesting. He lands in Caesarea, goes, goes up to Jerusalem, and finally back to Antioch. That's not, a, that's not a short trip, right? But that's all in that one little verse. What's important about that? He goes back to the church that sponsored him and, and clearly gives a, gives a full report there. 
That entire second missionary journey probably took about three years. But he doesn't stay in Antioch for long. In verse 23, it says, And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all disciples. So here we go, third missionary journey, starting from where? Antioch. Where does he go first? The same church as he had started in Galatia and Phrygia, and that's where he starts. He will then take a little different tact, uh, but we will uh, we'll pass on that till we get to uh, till Stephen next week. A couple of questions that we didn't get to. Um, the, the Aquila and Priscilla, um, what did they correct? It looks like uh, they, they, he was, Apollos was incredibly skilled in the law. He was able to refute the Jews uh, and did so powerfully in Ephesus and Corinth. <clears throat> but while he was in Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla noticed that he was not, didn't have quite everything uh, correct, missing this key component of Christianity, which appears to have been the baptism for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus. He had been preaching the baptism of John. Based upon what later happens, um, most likely Apollos was uh, baptized into Christ, but we're really left out with those, some of those specific details. But based upon chapter 19, it, it, it probably happened. But Apollos becomes a very trusted friend uh, and co-worker. He's mentioned multiple times in the other uh, writings of Paul. <clears throat> um, and it appears in 1 Corinthians 1 that he's talking about this episode where Apollos goes back to Corinth, where uh, Paul planted and Apollos did what? He watered, right? Really important uh, a, a combination there. We didn't get to talk about uh, the uh, Priscilla's teaching. We'll leave that to another time, another interesting topic. But uh, we'll leave Apollos in Corinth, and Paul is traveling to Galatia, beginning of his third missionary journey, revisiting his churches there. And we will, Paul will return to Ephesus, and so will we next week with Stephen. Thank you for your attention.